Hi everybody, my name is Joey and I'm the Perfect Score Tutor. Over the past 15 years or so, I've helped hundreds of kids boost their test scores and I've helped quite a few kids navigate the application process. So in this video, we'll be demystifying the UC application portal. I say this because a lot of families and students come to me and they're really, really anxious about every single little checkbox. And so what I thought I'd do for you is I'd do a deep dive into the actual application and highlight some of the components that can kind of matter and highlight some of the other components that really don't make a difference in your application process. So before we dive into this video, I do want to make a quick disclaimer. All these are my personal opinions and not representatives of the UCs themselves. However, I have found that this is really helpful when I'm working with students. So first off, we have the login page, right? So you gotta sign in. Make sure you're using an email that won't get canceled by the time you graduate from high school. So don't use a school email address because then that can cause you know, some sort of administrative errors down the road. So use an email like Gmail or Yahoo or something like that. So right now we're the fall of 2025. So let's look through here. Um, this is all the uh, about you information section first. They ask for a live name maybe, so that's if you go by a certain nickname or maybe you've uh, re-identified yourself. So you can choose a live name there. Uh, different legal names, this is for legal purposes, right? Because they might ask for that sort of like tax documentations, not tax documentations, legal documents, excuse me. Here they have the CASSID number. So one of the new things for the class of 2025 is they're putting all your information into the interwebs and then from there you can kind of download your school specific information so if you want to try to put in your 10 digit cass id then you can try to link your account with the uc application this is only for california public high school students so if you if you don't go to high school in california or your school doesn't participate in this yet you're just going to have to manually enter your academic information it doesn't take that much time under citizenship and residency, they just want to determine if you are a California resident and a US citizen. So they really care that you've attended a California high school for three or more years. If you say no, then there's a bunch of questions that you're going to have to answer to determine residency. So typically, if you attend high school out of the state of California, you do not qualify for residency unless your parents live in the state and file taxes in the state of California. Um, California has one of the worst residency requirements here, so trying to game the system to get in-state tuition is not going to work. The UCs do not have the budget to support out-of-state students. In fact, they want out-of-state students to kind of make up for their budget shortfall. So only answer truthfully here, otherwise you're opening up a can of worms. Moving on to the demographic section. So I get a lot of questions here. It's like, why are they asking me? Why are they asking me what my race is? What are they, why are they asking me about my identity? And so all this is for data collection purposes. So it's up to you however much of this information you want to answer. You can falsify your information if you want. Please don't falsify your information. But this is just for data collection purposes and will not be used for the application review process. In fact, the UCs have not participated in affirmative action since the late 90s when it was outlawed by the California state government. Under background, so normally none of these criteria will apply to you, but they might want to know if you're like a, an older student, uh, a student who might have dependents, maybe your foster care student, that one they do care about. So for most students, this doesn't apply. And then under household information, they're asking you about who you live with, and so the nice thing about the application is they do have these little like blue eye buttons, right? And you can kind of see, it tries to answer the question to your best of your ability. Now, one major question I get all the time is, what was the total income earned in 2023 by your parents? And so the reason they're asking this is not to get up all in your business. They're asking you to see if you qualify for a fee waiver. If you fall below certain thresholds, depending on how many dependents your parents have, then you may qualify for the four free fee waivers. Otherwise, you can just put whatever number you want there. Again, it doesn't matter if you're over the, you know, certain guidelines over there. Otherwise, if you fall above this certain like threshold, then you can just put whatever number in there. You can estimate, they're not gonna verify this information. Same thing over here with the parent information. You can go as broad or as specific as you want to. It shouldn't have an impact in your application. The reason they ask these is to see if you qualify as a first-generation college student. So the way the UCs define first-generation college student is that neither parent should have completed a four-year degree. So if we look at this check mark over here, right? You have no high school, some high school, high school graduate, some college or university, that means they never finished. Two-year college graduate, that means they got their AA degree or graduated from community college. If 
both of your parents fall under these first five categories and you're considered a first generation college student, if one of your families has graduated and got a bachelor's degree or some other degree beyond that, then you are no longer considered a first generation college student and this will have an impact on your application. Let's say if you want to falsify this information and try to get away with it, remember that a lot of the UCs do an audit process of a certain sample of successful students. So they might ask you for documentations verifying certain criteria. And if at that time they audit your application and then they ask you to provide verification and you can't, then that will open up a whole can of worms. You'll probably get your application rescinded. Uh, they might tell other partner institutions. Yeah, just moral of the story, don't lie. Okay, moving on. So we have the, the campuses, right? So we have the nine campuses. Remember, San Francisco is a graduate institution. So here you can choose which ones that you want to pick. Um, give UC Merced some love, please. And so then the questions that I get a lot is about choosing your major. So how should you choose your major? Well, in general, you should choose the more selective or the more impacted major for your primary major. What could be a selective major? Computer science, engineering, sometimes biology. And the nice thing here is if you select one of these majors, it'll tell you. So for example, I went to the Berkeley one, right? And I clicked under the business school, one of their brand new business schools, highly, highly selective. It says only applicants who select the business major as their primary major will be considered for admissions. Those not selected to the program will not be considered for admission to UC Berkeley. And so they give you that warning. This is true for many of the selective majors. And so a lot of students are like, oh, I'm just gonna put the engineering major as my alternate major. That's kind of a waste of space because if you do not make it into engineering for your first choice, you're just not gonna make it into that program. So the general piece of advice is to put the less impacted major as your alternate major. So for example, under Davis, You'll see that they have College of Letters and Sciences, right? So that's normally the general school that has all the random majors, biology, physics, math, humanities, that sort of stuff. But even within the school, you might see that they have a impacted major. For example, um, their design major is impacted. So if you're curious about what is an impacted major, you can go to the school's website and they'll be very straightforward with that. So just as a rule of thumb, Anything with letters and sciences is going to be the least selective ones. Anything that has any of these other names might be more impacted to get into. So moving on here, we have the UC San Diego College Ranking. So this is one thing unique to UC San Diego. What they do is they try to split the school up into eight different like mini campuses. They all have their own dormitory, they have their own resources, dining hall. They have their own graduation requirements. Now does this impact your chances of admission? No. This could impact your academic story if you get admitted to the campus. So what are some of the things that you wanna consider? Well, they give you this link that you can click on over here, right? So if you look within the link and you look within the different colleges, you can explore that they all have different um, housing profiles and they all have different graduation requirements. That's the biggest one. Engineers choose Revell because it has the more STEMI requirements, but then people who are maybe in humanities might choose Eleanor Roosevelt. And I think Eleanor Roosevelt has a language other than English requirement to graduate. So for example, if you're not good at learning different languages, then you might not want to choose Eleanor Roosevelt. Another thing you do want to consider is because these campuses are so gigantic, you can just Google UCSD. And then by looking at the map, you can kind of see where the different colleges are. So for example, John Muir is over here, Ravel College is over here, and then you have the brand new like Eighth College. So I'm gonna type in Eighth College since it doesn't show up on the map, but you can see it's all the way on the southwest side of campus. So that means that if you're taking classes that are far, far away, you have to get a bike, you have to walk, you have to take the bus so it might not be as convenient for you. So things to consider are the dorm, the location, as well as the graduation requirements. Okay, moving on in the academic history. So this is the most important part because remember the first five components of the UC Comprehensive Review focus on the classes that you've taken and how you've done in those classes. So the classes that matter most in seventh and eighth grade is if you've taken any math, or language classes. A lot of students who graduate from a California high school will have this on their high school transcript. However, if you don't, and you have a middle school transcript that can verify this, that's great. Then you can report any Algebra 1, Geometry, and or Algebra 2 classes. Same if you took like Spanish 1 for whatever reason in middle school. 
Moving on, you want to report every single high school that you've attended. So maybe you're the type of student who took a high school class over summer at a different high school. Then you need to report different high schools, even if they all show up on your high school transcript. That's just to make sure everything's accurately represented there. And when you're entering courses of grades, remember that UCs only count A through G classes. So what's an A through G class? These are these academic classes that you'll be taking. If you're at a California high school, it's really easy to look on your transcript. Usually those are called the college prep classes. Now, if you're out of state, then you need to kind of match it up with one of, the, one of these classes here. Now, if you haven't done that, that's okay. There's something called admissions by exception. You still could be admitted to a UC campus, but your likelihood does drop a bit. College is attended while in high school. So this is true if you've taken any sort of dual enrollment classes or community college classes on your own. So if you've done dual enrollment classes, then you want to put in the college class. Do not report it on both your high school transcript and your college transcript. Just report it as a college class. So the question I get a lot is, but I didn't do really well in this class. Can I just kind of like slip it under the rug and not report it? No. What happens is when you take a community college class, your transcript gets reported to something called the National Clearinghouse, and there's a way for them to verify any sort of classes that you've taken. And if what's in the National Clearinghouse doesn't match what you've reported the UCs, then that's considered fraud, let's say. And so that would could be a reason for them to reject your application. Senior year classes, this is another one that I get questions on about a lot. So when you're taking a senior year class, you can pick IP for in progress for this semester and then PL for next semester for planned. Okay, and then if you didn't get a grade or if you're taking a single semester course, then you'd report it like this, right? If you see grade one IP and grade two as no, that to the UCs means that you're taking a single semester class. Moving on to additional info, you should be taking advantage of this spot if there's any sort of weird anomalies in your transcript. So let's say your grades dipped one semester because you got really, really sick for two weeks. They're not gonna know that unless you tell them. Another thing that might happen is you wanted to take AP Bio, but you couldn't fit into your schedule. It's only offered fourth period and you had orchestra. Well, if you don't report it, then they're not going to know and they might think that you were lazy or something like that, right? So if there's anything that kind of is weird about your schedule, you want to put it in here because you won't have letters of recommendation to support you. So you end up needing to be your biggest advocate over here. So under activity section, so like I said, most of these don't matter. However, there's this one that I get a lot of questions about is the educational prep program. So they're just trying to identify specific ones. So if you click on the drop down, you'll see that there are a lot of California based ones. So let's say you go to school out of state and got into something like Gov School or something like that, and you considered an educational prep program where, you know, it's a, a selective program where you learn something cool about research or something like that, then you can do other and then put in the name of your program but these are typically reserved for like selective summer programs at a college or university. And then otherwise, if you took some other coursework that you want to report, let's say for some reason you took health and thought it was like really significant, or another one that I see with private school students is they did a lot of work through theology. They had to write these like 10 page research papers or something like that. Then you can report that under other coursework. I encourage you to use this with a lot of discretion. You shouldn't just be reporting every single random course that you've taken. I'm not gonna go too much into PIQs here. I do have a whole blog series on my website about it and I'll leave the information in the comments below. But as you're filling out these PIQs, number one, don't put them directly into the application. The application still has some bugs in it so it doesn't always save, okay? So you should do it in a separate document. But the other thing I want you to think about is, are you providing extra value to your application or do you have a missed opportunity here? This is language that the UCs actually use themselves. They're looking through the entire PIQs to see, oh, does this give me more information about like what the student wants to study, what sort of impact they're gonna make on campus, what sort of impact they've made in high school. So then if you're going through writing things as if there's some sort of short story, or if you're repeating stuff from your activities list, or if you're talking about your grandma instead of talking about yourself, those are kind of missed opportunities. So remember, don't be very vague, be as specific as possible, include specific stories, specific facts, specific information, because you need to be your biggest advocate while you're using the PIQs. Something that I've seen a lot of families freak out over is like, oh my gosh, there's a typo here, and then you know they forgot a period or a comma, or they spelled principal wrong. I've seen principal spelled wrong a lot of times. Um, don't worry too much about typos, right? If there's a little thing here or a little thing there, they're not going to penalize you for it. What they're doing when they're reading the PIQs is they're trying to get a sense of who you are as a student. So this is your chance to brag about yourself. Don't be shy. 
and don't like hint at things, right? Just be explicit and use lots of I statements. So over here we have a response to PIQ number one, and if you want to take a second to read through it, but you can see that this is kind of vague. There's not a lot of specific pieces of information. I don't see exactly what they did. They just said they're summer staff and that offered them leadership, right? But what are they doing? No clue. So this would be an example of a missed opportunity. Here's another example of something really short, right? It's about half the word count. But then you can see that they use much more specific language. Uh, we began drafting a resolution. I worked to gather more members. I moved to propose the resolution. Um, eventually, the resolution to make my school district a sanctuary district was passed unanimously. So notice how they used a little bit of story here, but it wasn't just about some random story, right? They were very specific with I statements and what they did. Finally, we have this additional comment section. So this one actually gives you 550 words. The other one is much shorter, only gives you 550 characters. So if you feel like the academic history wasn't broad enough or there wasn't enough space for you to put that in there, you can put that in over here. This is also a chance to talk about any other extenuating circumstances. So again, maybe there was an issue with your um, health, let's say, that prevented you from doing your best. Or maybe there's uh, certain awards that you want to talk more about. Usually that's not the case, okay? So don't go spewing a bunch of info here. Um, one thing that I've seen that students do like to do here is then they like to put in a bunch of links and stuff. Remember that UCs don't really care about links. They're not clickable. They don't have time to go through and check links. So I guess if you want to put links here, you can, but it's kind of a not necessary thing. So there's this balance of wanting to be concise and to the point, but also want to advocate for yourself. So make sure you brag about yourself, and you should be able to in the activities and the PIQs. If there's truly something else that you can't, then you should put that over here. If there's certain questions that you want to ask about this additional info section, feel free to leave a question below. All right, and we've made it to the final screen, right? So then what you want to do on the final screen is then if you want, you can do the print version and then you can print out everything to look through things and just make sure that your personal information is correct. So like I said, the typos aren't really going to matter on your activities and your PIQs, right? However, certain typos, for example, on your name, on your address, on your social security number, those can cause a huge headache. Another discrepancy that I've seen on the application is let's say you reported that you were going to take such and such math class at the local community college the second semester of senior year and then all of a sudden you decide you can't do it for whatever reason, scheduling, you're too stressed out, um, whatever other reason. If you do not report that to the UCs, that could be considered some sort of misalignment. I don't want to call it fraud because you're not trying to trick the system, right? But there's just some sort of misalignment there that doesn't match up with what you reported. As soon as you submit this application, they're going to take every everything that you reported here as truth and fact. So then if something doesn't align, it's up to you as a student to reach out to the UCs to let them know that something has changed. It's better for you to be proactive than have them come back to you and be like, hey, why is this not matching up? Because then that's when the whole like can of worms open and people get stressed out unnecessarily so. Hopefully this helps. I tried to go through the major components of the applications, but I'm sure there's little nuances that I might have missed. So if you have any questions about those little nuances, feel free to leave a question or comment below. Thanks for watching.